Namaskaram. Happy Engineers Day. In earlier times, engineering for civil society simply meant civil engineering, as distinct from military engineering. On Engineers Day, we Indians fondly remember the unparalleled contributions of Sri Moksha Gundam Vishweshwaraya in the field of civil engineering in India. He described an engineer as a person who applies the skills and knowledge of basic science for the good of society. What can we ordinary engineers do to emulate Sri Vishweshwaraya? to bring self-reliance to engineers in India. This essentially means finding and expressing our self-confidence and freeing ourselves from dependence on technology from the Western world and other countries. I speak to you from IIT Madras, an institution set up in the 1960s with support from West Germany. During the passage of more than 50 years, IIT Madras has learned to become self-reliant. And today, if we collaborate with other countries, including Germany, in the field of technology, it is always as equal partners. Now, rather than giving you a talk or preaching on the subject of self-reliance, I plan to simply serve as a storyteller, sharing with you glimpses of my personal story of some of the challenges I faced playing the role of an engineer. When I completed my BTEC in 1980 from IIT Madras, the trend was to go to the US for further studies. And many of my classmates have settled there as US citizens. We had two kinds of migration, one geographical and the other a migration from core engineering to other fields more attractive and lucrative. Today in India, the first kind of migration has reduced significantly because of so many opportunities available in India. But the second kind continues. Let us not pass judgment on our youth. May they all prosper, actualize their full potential in whatever field they choose to specialize in, whether it be engineering or otherwise, and find fulfillment in life. My prefer preference, however, was to stay in India. And I took up a campus placement offer as a structural designer in a company at New Delhi, which had very few engineers, all from IITs, but which was very productive. Our motto was to do structural design better than, faster than, and more economically than anybody else. I quickly realized that there was a big gulf between the theory I had learned at college and actual practice, designing all kinds of structures in concrete, steel, and masonry. I found the learning experience and the work very exciting, challenging, and joyful. We would find ourselves working some 12 hours every day with plenty of draftsmen around us who were constantly seeking work from us. And this also included several site visits. I had dreams of setting up my own consultancy practice, which I eventually did in partnership with two architects. There was one particular incident which triggered a major change in my life. We had taken up the design of a township for a public sector company near Kanpur, but we found that our bills were not getting cleared because the engineers in the department wanted a bribe. And this troubled me a lot. I knew that I was standing at a major crossroad in life. Do I give in and continue with this corruption in order to succeed in life? 
nothing in my education, nothing in my upbringing had prepared me to face this issue. It was, as uh, Socrates once put it, a clear feeling that I would kind of lose something in my soul if I walked in that direction. And so it drove me inwards and I asked myself a lot of questions. The first question I asked myself was, look, I had believed that being my own boss was the best thing possible. And here I was, reasonably making enough money, but I was very discontent. What is the purpose of my life? I was really shocked to discover that this fundamental question was something that I had never asked of myself. Proud as I was of uh, being able to answer any question, thanks to my education at IIT. So I looked around for answers. I met even CEOs of companies who were very accomplished. And I got the next biggest shock of my life. I discovered that they didn't know. Nobody knew. In fact, some of them said, these are perennial questions mankind has been asking. And if you really want to find answers for these, maybe you should go to the Himalayas. I took their suggestion seriously. And that's exactly what I did for some time. And in my travels to the Himalayas, I find, found some answers to my questions. I am grateful to my gurus, especially Swami Krishnananda of Rishikesh and Sri A.D. Pisharati, my mentor at Delhi, for opening me to truths that I was never exposed to. I glimpsed the possibility of being totally at peace and content. In the words of the Gita, it was yoga kshemam bahamyaham, not to worry in the very least about my material well-being, which was definitely going to be taken care of as long as I walked the path of truth and expressed it in my work and in my life, truth, goodness and beauty. Satyam, Shivam, Sundara. And this would give, to give another quote from the same Gita, a sense of Nitya tripto nirashayaha. What lovely words. Nitya tripta. To be ever content regardless of what happens. Nirashraya. The ultimate self reliance. Not depending on anything for our well being. This is the highest self reliance possible, coming from the highest wisdom of India. And later I was to immerse myself in teachings of Adi Shankara, Ramana Maharshi, Meister Eckhart, a Christian mystic, Hazrat Inayat Khan, a Sufi mystic, J. Krishnamurti, and Sri Aurobindo. Well, I had to come back to Kerala, where my parents had settled after my father's retirement from Calcutta, from service. And I realized that uh, my father was not well 
and I really wanted to be with him, to live beside him for some time. But I was wondering what I would do. It was my father who suggested, they were living at Calicut, said, there is a regional engineering college here. Would you like to try teaching? I said, why not? But when we inquired, we found that the, the college had not advertised for any post for the last five years or so. So I left telling my father, if something comes up, let me know. And within the two days of my leaving uh, Calicut, an advertisement appeared in the local newspapers, the Madhurubhumi, which my father sent me as a cutout by post. And when I saw that, I knew the call had come. I knew it was time for a major change. I packed my bags and came to Calicut. And to cut a long story short, I ended up as a lecturer in civil engineering at REC Calicut. When I took my first class, I still remember structural analysis three with a bunch of students, I realized that it was like a fish taking to water. This is what I was meant to do. But the challenge was, I knew at the back of my mind, not just to teach the subject and make it interesting, but somehow to bring in the larger picture of fulfillment in life, a holistic education. How is it possible? How will it work out? So let me begin with a small story. You see there a picture of the Taj Mahal, a real wonderful construction made out of marble by ordinary labor. And the story goes, someone was visiting the construction site and was curious to see how the laborers were building the structure. A lot of people were lined up cutting stone, marble. And so this visitor asked one of those laborers a simple question. What are you doing? And the answer given was, can't you see what I'm doing? I'm cutting stone. The correct answer, but the answer reflected a kind of mechanical doing, a kind of couldn't care less, a half-hearted doing, and and not a full involvement. This uh, visitor walked around and saw the vast majority of people were cutting stone in the same way until he chanced upon someone who had a radiance about him, who would do his work carefully, kindly, meticulously. He would lift up a piece of marble, raise it in the air, and bring his chisel to cut it exactly the way he wanted it into two pieces. He would gently lower down one piece, raise the other and look at it and smile. The visitor approaches him and asks the same question. What are you doing? And he gets a mind blowing answer. This person smiles at him and says, I'm building the Taj Mahal. How many of us are living life mechanically, doing whatever we are required to do, whether it be engineering or whatever, in a half-hearted way just to earn our livelihood? And how many of us are really living a vision? You'll find that the numbers are going to be very small for those who have a vision. And it's not just a vision of building a, 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 a monument, any vision that we may have. So Stephen Covey, 
in a book called The Eighth Habit, pointed out at four qualities that are needed for fulfillment in any walk of life. Firstly, we must have a vision. Secondly, we must be able to do what people sometimes say, hard work. But it's really not hard work once you do it as a matter of self-discipline. Uh, discipline is a, a bad word for students because it's enforced from outside. But self-discipline is a kind of sadhana. Exactly that which a singer or a musician engages daily in order to master the art or a runner who takes to running does. In the beginning, it's hard work. But after some time, you're not doing anything. It's a flow state. The wind takes you there. In addition, we need passion. We need fire in the belly. We need enthusiasm. And uh, this often dies with age, but you have people like Sri Abdul Kalam, who till the very end was full of energy, you know, the fire in the belly. And finally, you also need something which Kavi called conscience, but I will call soul. And it is that which makes your vision noble for the well-being of all and uh, not something that is Hitler-like. When all these four aspects are in full bloom, you become a creative force in the world. You will find your true voice, your own voice. You will inspire others also to find their voice. And you will become a full person, a whole person. And you will display integrity. Integrity really means minimizing the gap between what we think what we say and what we do. And we are a source of inspiration for everybody around us by simply being who we truly are. Now this looks wonderful, but we all know that this is exceptional. Kavi himself in his studies realized that the reality is quite different. In his words, despite all our progress and development, most people are not thriving in the organizations they work for. They are neither fulfilled nor excited. They are frustrated. That's a strong word. They have no clear vision and they are bogged down and distracted. They don't feel they can improve much. So what went wrong? Let's take a look. Well, the first sign that things have gone wrong is when we find ourselves complaining. So instead of abiding by a vision that we have and which we wish to share with the world, we tend to become victims. We complain. We talk of corruption in society. We, the student says the teaching is not good. The library is not good enough. There's no water in the tap. So there's no end to the complaints that are possible. And uh, we are more on the side of the problem than on the side of the solution. Instead of disciplining, we start indulging and the sadhana goes for a toss. And instead of having our passion in full bloom, we are just like everybody else. We reflect the social mirror. And instead of being governed by our soul, our innermost being, we are governed by our ego. Our interests are very selfish and self-centered. Instead of being a creative force in the world, we are programmed. It's like a cultural software is running us. Instead of finding our true voice, we lose our voice. And instead of inspiring others to find their voice, we will end up conspiring and preventing others from finding their voice. Instead of being a whole person, I end up being a fragmented person. Instead of showing integrity, I show a lack of integrity, which means there is a big gap between thought, word, and action. I want to begin by paying homage to my teachers. 
I am selecting a few of them who, who were stalwarts in the field of structural engineering at IIT Madras. First, Professor P. Srinivasa Rao, my mentor, my guide for my BTEC thesis, and later my guide for my PhD thesis. He was a real authority in concrete design. All of you who have studied civil engineering would have referred to the IS-456 code and the stress strain curve for concrete in compression, which you've seen, parabolic and rectangular, has come from his work when he was at the Technical University in Munich for his doctorate working under Professor Ryush, one of the original founding masters of reinforced concrete theory. So I was fortunate to work with him for many years. And uh, the second person is Professor P.K. Arvindan, whom you will all well know in the state of Kerala. He was a real master engineer, very practical designer, with a sound understanding of the subject. Uh, he, along with Professor C.S. Krishnamurti and Professor V. Kalyan Raman, happened to be later my colleagues when I joined IIT Madras as a faculty on their invitation. Each one of them is brilliant, is a master, is an example of someone who's found fulfillment in the profession that they practice. Very unfortunately, Professor Krishnamurti and Professor Arvindan are no longer with us. They have passed away. And uh, let me give an instance of how I was inspired by Professor Arvindan, with whom I used to travel and work very closely. He was always on call for any emergency in the realm of structural engineering. Once there was an accident at a factory in near Chennai, and there was an explosion and the boiler stopped working and the plant had to shut down. So he was immediately called and I accompanied him. And uh, we found that the boiler was housed on a portal frame structure, four beams on four columns. And uh, the beams were all showing severe signs of shear cracking suggesting some heavy load was uh, acting somehow. Now we were wondering how, what additional load could act because there was the weight of the boiler and it happened in the middle of the night. And I could see the line of thinking of Professor Arvind. You, know, you have to diagnose a, pro a problem fully in order to give a solution. And he was, of course, we could give a solution. We could strengthen it. Uh, retrofitted, jacketed, which we eventually did, but we, we were not happy. And we came back and, and went back again. And he, he said, I want to talk to all the people who were here when this accident took place. And we finally located someone who actually witnessed what had happened. Something had exploded within the boiler and it jumped up above quite high and when it fell down, there was an impact, a dynamic load, which no one had anticipated. And uh, that's what caused the cracking. Then we were comfortable and we knew what to do. Professor Rao introduced what was the expert in India for the design of RC tall towers, largely because of his experience in Germany uh, especially the towers in Stuttgart, which he was involved in. So you can see the map of India sprinkled with tall TV towers made of reinforced concrete with heights greater than 300 meters. And uh, you will probably remember that when the Bhuj earthquake took place in 2001, the famous Gujarat earthquake whose effects we felt even in, at Chennai, that tower, which was located on a fault, survived thanks to, uh, thanks to divine grace, actually, but also to the efforts put in 
by the faculty at IIT Madras. And here's a write-up from the Hindu, which says that this Durdashan tower escaped the quake's fury as it was designed to withstand shocks up to eight meter eight on the Richter scale. Well, Professor Rao gave me a problem when I came back here to join for my PhD. He was a consultant to, to many companies involved in designing chimneys and towers, and not just in India, but also abroad. He gave me a simple problem. He said, look, Devdas, in the world today, you can design the same chimney by different codes, by different practices, and they recommend different factors of safety on the load side and the resistance side. And we end up with different uh, economies. And that doesn't make sense. Obviously, some are more safe than the others and some are possibly unsafe. How do we evaluate? How do we even come up with a self-reliant design? How do we change our code? That was the problem given to me. And uh, he said, it's your baby, you solve it. And I had to struggle a lot, learn the principles of random vibration and all that. At the end, after two and a half years, I came up with the solution, which was widely published. And the solution showed that there were different probabilities of failure for different towers of different geometries designed by these different codes. And what we really had to aim for was to avoid unsafe designs, avoid uneconomical designs, and arrive at provisions that would allow us to operate them at the acceptable range of safety. And I'm happy to report that some of our findings were later incorporated in the IS4998, which is the BIS code for the design of concrete chimneys. And uh, I was for fortunate to serve as the chairman of the BIS committee of uh, CED 38 on special structures, which did uh, a lot of new codes. Another new code that we brought up, and I must thank the convener, uh, engineer Alpa Sheth of Mumbai for having coordinated it, is a new code, a brand new code, which most countries don't have on the design of tall buildings in the country. We wanted to have the best practices and uh, it had to be with the competence that we have in India. So let me go to a basic issue that will trouble all of us. How do we find fulfillment at work? In my view, first of all, we must find out what we are good at. And as a young person, we'll find that we are good at many things. If you're a good student, you'll be good in all subjects. And uh, where do you specialize later in life? How do you find your way? So the next thing to look at is, what do you love doing? Where is your passion? And one easy way of finding this out is, where do you like to spend time and not even feel time pass? And that will clearly point to where you need to go. So you, we may be good at many things, but we will really be passionate about only a few of those things. The next thing to find out is, what is our soul calling? What is the true inner calling, which in the Indian tradition is called Swabhava or Swadharma? And that requires some in-depth search. For example, I found out that my passion and my love was in structural engineering, but also in awakening. And that was my true soul calling. And that's what made me a teacher. And then fulfillment gets complete only when whatever we are good at, whatever we love doing and whatever is our inner calling, adds value to society. And surely in engineering, there are so many domains where there is a real need to add value. 
in the field of civil engineering itself. So much work needs to be done to provide housing for millions of people who do not have a house to live under, to provide infrastructure, transportation, to provide portable water, to take care of effluent treatment, to provide for irrigation, you name it. Civil engineers have a tremendous responsibility. And if you find that it is also matching with your talent, your passion, and your inner calling, then nothing should stop us. We can all do what Sri Vishweshwaraya recommends that we do. And the important thing is to know that whatever we do should have the best in us, the best quality. And as Henry Ford put it, quality means doing it right when no one is looking. There's an old saying, a bad teacher complains, a good teacher explains, a master teacher inspires. Very, very true. So if we are fortunate to learn under a master teacher, something happens to us. We discover the joy of learning and we are further inspired to learn on our own. In fact, if I'm grateful to IIT Madras for one thing in my education, it is that they didn't really teach us too much. They taught us how to learn. And uh, that is all that we need for lifelong learning because we, are, we need to learn throughout our lives, but we need to learn it well. We need to learn it with a clear understanding so that we get to the root of the problem and we end up with creative and innovative solutions. So if you're a teacher, you'll find the way of teaching makes a huge difference. Let me just give an example in engineering, in the field of mechanics. And it's all about developing a scientific temperament. You, you will fall in love with the scientific temperament because it gives you so much clarity. Well, in any system, you have a system is complex. You have a stimulus and you have a response. And uh, there are certain laws which govern the behavior of any system. Could be a structural system, could be an economic system, could be a political system, could be a physiological system, it doesn't matter. Now let's take a structural system for example. What is the secret of the system? Well, this is something we teach in strength of materials. We are all familiar with the tension test. Imagine you have, you have a steel rod which you are pulling, applying tension. It has an original length L, it has an extension E when you apply a force P. And if you were to do this experiment and you were to plot a graph of load versus elongation, you would expect to get a straight line if the material follows Hooke's law and the line will pass through the origin. Now imagine a conceptual experiment where every student is asked to do this experiment and to make sure they don't cheat or copy, we give them all bars of different lengths and different cross-section areas, but of the same material. And we make them all do the experiment. Now, this is a question we can ask in the class without actually doing any experiment and you ask, Will everybody get the same straight line? The answer is no. If you have 100 students and 100 bars, you'll get 100 straight lines. Now we could stop this experiment and move on and say, good, we saw a principle of linearity here, but that's not enough. The bars are different only in terms of geometry, in terms of dimensions, cross-section and length. There is something common to all of them. They are made of the same material. So a uh, scientific temper wants to pull out that quality by eliminating all the others. So the question we can pose to the student is, without doing any further experiments, how do we learn that concept? What should we do? 
then one or two bright students in the class will tell what you need to do. All you need to do is to change the axis instead of having an X axis. Uh, the other thing to notice, uh, the bars which are stiff are the ones with high cross section area and low length. The bars which are flexible are the ones which have low area and high length. And this is something we can figure out. But the real secret comes out when you divide P by A and you get the actual stress and you divide E by L and you get the strain and then everybody gets exactly the same line and the slope of that line gives you the modulus velocity. It's a very simple example, but it shows it's the beginning of, of a, a mind which seeks to know the truth, seeks to have a research attitude to everything in life. But teaching and learning should not always be theory. The real fun is in putting things to practice. Now here's an example of something we did at a festival which we call Shastra at IIT Madras. And there used to be an item called the greatest thing in the world. Look at the imagination of the students. They wanted to do something that nobody else has ever done. And invariably it has to be something big and not small, which people can appreciate. And so invariably it is a civil engineering structure. And the planning of this goes back to six months or so. So they came up with this idea with help from us faculty of building a bridge made of only two materials, newspaper and rope. Newspaper and rope, imagine. So this is a, and we had students who, you know, once the project started going, we had students from all departments, not just civil engineering, we had mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, computer science, electrical, naval architecture, everybody wanted to join in. And uh, faculty had to help, the lab staff had to help, a lot of tests were done on newspaper getting rolled up and uh, the compressive strength being determined. And finally, in the Kendriya Vidyalaya grounds, on one fine day, this was erected. Nothing went right from the word go, but somehow it all worked. It was erected. It was uh, tested. People walked on it. And uh, they even wanted to call, uh, they called the, the TV crew and all that. They wanted to apply for the Guinness Book of Records. Um, but unfortunately, that night it rained. And unfortunately, we were not prepared for that. And so it went down. But nevertheless, it was a phenomenal experience, which uh, shook the whole campus. And one of the students, the leader, Anita Rao, went ahead and published a paper in one of the top journals in the world, the AAC Journal for Professional Issues in Engineering Education. This is 2006, called Design and Construction of the Longest Rope State Newspaper Footbridge. Just to give you an example. When I joined REC Calicut, uh, we wanted to do something of local interest and instead of doing something hi-fi. And so we thought we'll work with coconut shell. You know, a coconut shell is wasted. It's a half shell. And the shell on testing is found to have significant load bearing capacity. On the average 500 kilogram force it can take. So we said, why don't we put it in a structural form that is subject to pure actual compression. And you know, if you take a necklace and you were to hang it with your hands, it takes a shape of pure tension and that's called a catenary. If you were to flip it over and somehow hold it as an arch, it would be subject to pure compression, a, a catenary arch. So this was a project which we did uh -huh. And uh, people involved included Professor Unikrishna Pillai, the director or the principal of REC Calicut, and Professor T.S. Balakopal. And uh, uh, we had students, and then this became a big hit. 
in fact we the you, we built a coconut shell house inside the campus itself and it won a few awards but we also went ahead and built it uh, in outside places in a place at melambur it was meant for a school the idea is to have a uh, form work inside which give you the catenary shape which you can unlock remove then you put bamboo strips to hold the coconut shells together there there's a small wire which goes through them 2 mm thick wire and uh, it's all held in place you plaster it on the outside you can remove the shuttering from inside plaster it on the inside and you have got a fairly comfortable house unfortunately i don't think it uh, it went into practice in any way it was experimental but it was for fun the other things we did while i was at rsc calicut was uh, uh, once i had given a talk at the local medical college to orthopedic doctors and students dr mani had called me for a talk and he he realized uh, you know I, you know we talked about how a material like bone the human bone can fracture and he was interested then he gave us several problems and we said we'll work together and so a center for biomechanics was started at rsc calicut and we came up with some inventions this particular invention was very interesting when you fall on your hands say a motorcycle accident or maybe uh, a coconut climber fell down and f- broke the wrist then you have what is called a compound fracture the the wrist bone breaks into many parts and uh, if you just put a plaster on it the the mobility of the wrist is lost there's pain forever so the doctors had this wonderful idea which they got from switzerland they had a device where you put an external fixator which penetrates the bone the front and the back and while the new bone is forming the patient is made to rotate the joint regularly in three directions vertically up and down horizontally left to right and rotate but that device was very expensive 1 1 lakh or 2 lakhs or so and so the doctor said can you engineers do something this is engineering and uh, i put together a team you can see their uh, dr m p chandrasekharan who was then the head of the uh, mechanical engineering department later he became the director of nit calicut and uh, professor nambudri pad and uh, some metallurgists and uh, structural engineers and we came up with this simple device very inexpensive which uh, can which the patient can use to unlock one degree of freedom at a time move the hand up and down or sideways or rotate lock it again and so on full recovery in a few months you get the full mobility with no uh, with no stiffness i'm just giving you challenges that engineers can face and must address then i got into book writing uh, thanks to professor unikrishna pillai my mentor uh, I joined him in writing a book, a textbook which came into publication in 1998, which has which has been widely used all over the country, and uh, I must say, and even today I'm in touch with Professor Pillay, and we are now working on the third, the fourth edition of this book. This is about 25 years later. Very sharp mind, clarity of concepts to perfection, and a way of writing. so i discovered the art of writing and the need for writing this is again self reliance because there are no good textbooks in india we always depend on books published in the western world can we do the same writing with originality with clarity going into the concepts and not just learning for the purpose of uh, passing examination but a deeper understanding and i'm happy to say that even today many practicing engineers post graduate engineers and teachers write to us giving suggestions and showing their appreciation for books like this and this is important because uh, 
especially when we find that many of our students are migrating from civil engineering. How do we really have an impact to the rest of the country, people who actually practice engineering? And this can be in the form of books. It can also be in the form of video lectures. And NPTEL has provided a wonderful platform for that. So I went on later to write books on structural analysis. And the motto was very clear, Albert Einstein's principle. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. This went through another edition. And then we find that in structural engineering, uh, unfortunately, today, most people are heavily dependent on softwares. And that's dangerous if you really don't know what's going on. It can be garbage in and garbage out. So some deeper understanding of what's in the software. In the olden days, designers did everything manually because they had a good feel for the structural behavior. They could, if you get a, an answer, say 520 kilonewton meter as a bending moment, you should have a feel, first of all, is it 520 or should it have been 5.2 or 5,200? Number one. Number two, should it have been positive or negative? Because you, you should end up putting the reinforcement in the right location. So a good, strong, fundamental understanding is important. Even when we use software, that's how the book on advanced structural analysis came. Then we were commissioned by the Indian Building Congress and the Central Public Works Department to write a, a manual, which I happen to be an editor of, on the seismic retrofit of buildings. Just to give you an example of how all this is important for self-reliance in India. But let me go back to that book, the cover picture on that book, on the first edition, uh, is a project we did at Cochin. Uh, the architect was N.M. Salim. Uh, and associates, and he had this idea of a ship-shaped structure. Uh, you can see it's a GCDA's stadium at Kadavantara in Ernakulam, a magnificent structure, a sh shaped like a ship. Now he made the model, but you know you need to do engineering drawing to convert a three-dimensional structure to a two-dimensional form, and you need to design it properly. The entire roof of the indoor stadium, which was meant to host the national games, was uh, supported on four columns, just four columns. And we had a fantastic truss arrangement which could hold it in place. And the entire design of this had to be done manually because we didn't have computers there. I must thank uh, Professor VJ Kurian, who joined along with me, but who had a lot of experience. Uh, for giving me a Casio programmable calculator, lending me, which he had got from abroad. You could see four lines on it. And uh, much of this work was done by actual programming, using a, uh, a programmable calculator, starting from first principle. Here's a picture that you see on top of a typical gallery frame inside the building. It's, it's a five-story structure. There's, Building is now used uh, to accommodate uh, people, there are offices, there are rooms where you can stay, and you have uh, the indoor court. So I, I still show this to my students. In the olden days, this is how we did the calculation. We did everything by hand. And uh, these are some 50 pages of calculation written on ordinary paper, all done by hand, manually, uh, you see, so many frames were analyzed using a self-made program. You had tapered beams for which you had to write stiffness matrices. And just to give you an example, in this frame, uh, there was a huge cantilever. And, and the columns were plus-shaped columns. And uh, how do you design them? How do you make sure it is safe? We found that there was a huge bending moment that was coming on the cantilever and which was getting transmitted to the column and ending up with heavy moments in the footing where we were putting piles. So how do you reduce those, more, the, those uh, forces? And so 
we had to talk to the architect and say we can do it by giving a backspan which is stiff so that the moment that's coming from the cantilever goes to the backspan doesn't go to the column doesn't go to the foundation but it has to be done with aesthetics it has to be done with curves and uh, architect salim was more than willing to do this as long as it worked and turned out to be economical so there's so much to learn there's so much innovation possible and it comes from an interaction between the engineer and the architect and a good understanding of the behavior and finally you have to convert everything to uh, for example a frame element you have an actual force you have a bending moment and a shear force you have to really design it to take everything we had staircases here which were spiral and which the diameter of the spiral was increasing and that was a challenge to design and uh, i gave it to an mtech student and we worked together and uh, it was designed it was built it was constructed and i, I very happy to visit this stadium now you can't see the ship so much because so much of construction has gone all around i want to express my gratitude to all the phd students it was a joy it is a joy to work with so many of them uh, from different parts of the country all brilliant and all hopefully many are already professors in various institutions in india and abroad Uh, some are practicing engineers this is how we build self reliance we should have clarity confidence and we should do projects that are practical so you will find every single project that we took up came from practice there was a real need for self reliance in the country and the only way is to do research and find a solution so i'll just give a couple of examples so this was my first student kumaran who is now a senior professor at annamalai university uh, you would have seen sleepers rail track sleepers made of precious concrete underneath the rails well the original design for these sleepers which are now being produced uh, in mass scale throughout the country came from the structural engineering laboratory of iit madras i think the project was originally got by our founding father of the department professor p c vargis but the work was really done by professor shrinivas rao professor arvind and professor n rajagopal and so they developed the original design which is still being used with modifications the long line method of pre stressing and so with the passage of years we realize it is time to re refine the design to make it more rational and more e uh, economical with the latest materials involved with the precessing wires currently being used and so we did a, a a big exercise of dynamic analysis considering the track uh, the real condition of the track loading getting inputs from rdso lucknow looking into the uh, locomotive movements about looking into the track connections with the sleepers looking into the soil profile which is uh, you know a, a elastic foundation and doing a thorough analysis and doing a reliability study and we came up with a solution which is with the rdso the uh, second project second student babu kurian worked on uh, another beautiful project um, while proof checking designs we found that box girder bridges which are very common in india uh, are done by a simplified method you assume that the box girder behaves like a beam in the longitudinal direction and you take a strip of it in the transverse direction and you analyze it like a frame now we knew that this is too simplistic and uh, when we ask for example where is the support for the frame at the bottom the practicing engineers uh, would would not have any answer they said this is a practice and even those people who are proof checking say it is so well in this connection i must tell you an incident um, because of our connections with germany and seeing so many beautiful bridges built there all of them continuous and not simply supported uh, we proposed the first continuous bridge 
uh, for a flyover at Chennai. And uh, when it came to approving the designs, and you know, it was going over the railways, so it was an ROB also. So uh, we really saw the problem with the department. We had a very senior chief bridge engineer who had just one year to retire and he was scared. He said, where is the precedence for this? Please show me in India any bridge which has been designed like this. And Professor Arvindan was in charge and he said, no, but there has to be a first time. We have to do it. So with great reluctance, he agreed, but he was still old fashioned. And he, when he saw this box girder, he said, please tell me how much of a load is going to the T-beam on the left and the T-beam on the right. And we, we had to explain to him, no, it's going to operate like a box. It's not separate T-beam, it's a new thing. And, it, and continuity will give you effortless riding comfort because you, know, you don't have a jump at the joint where the supports are, which you have in a simply supported cave. But to all, uh, to full credit to him, he said, I don't know, but I'll give you my best engineer. You convince him, let him check your designs, and then we'll approve. And that's exactly what we did. So we have good engineers, even in the department. Uh, and we need to work. We need self-reliance by first learning ourselves, having the confidence, and then teaching others. So here, these uh, simplistic methods have serious errors. Mm -hmm. Some, for example, in the longitudinal analysis, the effect of shear lag is pronounced. You can't assume the whole section to behave together with one neutral axis. That's an error. And in the transverse analysis, it's really a beam on elastic foundation. And on, uh, only a three-dimensional finite element analysis with all possibilities could, could correct it. And we had to do load testing to even check on the ultimate load. Well, Babu Kurian did a phenomenal job. He had many publications, but most notably in the Journal of Bridge Engineering of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And we were happy to see that this was a practice not just in India, worldwide, which needed correction. I want to show you some work we did on housing, and it's a video that I'm going to play. Please watch. All right, now some news from Chennai, where the IIT Madras has designed an extremely affordable house that's strong or weatherproof, and above all, environment friendly. It's an Australian technology which uses a glass fiber reinforced gypsum. Gypsum is an industrial waste that's available in plenty, and the construction costs just twelve fifty per square foot. But for more on this, let's go across to NDTV Sam Daniel, who's at this house in uh, IIT uh, there in uh, Chennai. Uh, Sam, tell us more about this much needed uh, technology. Uh, you know, cheap housing for the poor. And when can we expect this to become uh, on a mass scale? Absolutely, Garg. In fact, I am right outside that particular house designed by IIT Madras to provide housing for the poor, millions of poor people who don't have a roof over their head. It's looking just like any other house. But the only difference is it doesn't have bricks. It has prefabricated panels, reduces concrete usage. It's very quick in a month. The house would be ready. I'm joined to tell us more about this by Professor Bhaskar Ramamurthy, the director of IIT Madras, and Professor Devdas Menon. Thank you both for joining us. Research and development is one thing, but unless the private builders take it up, it's not going to become popular. Are they signs? Are they promising enough? To... We believe that the uh, level to which this technology has been brought, you know, in terms of taking care of all these issues, getting it certified by a national organization that gives a certification for such technologies, setting up the production units and so on. I believe we have reached that point, but you are quite right. Finally, there's a lot of work to be done in getting this accepted. And once, you know, they, they talk about something going viral, once there's an acceptance, it'll grow very fast. At that time, we'll need factories set up for this panels almost in every state right. so that the cost of transportation is reduced. So there's a long way to go. But I think we are, this is not at a prototype stage or a proof of concept stage. This is at a stage where it's ready to go. So coming to you, do we have enough amount of uh, gypsum available to, for this kind of a technology? We have. Actually, the fertilizer industry waste itself is around 40 million tons building up annually. But we have many other sources of gypsum. So I think for a long time, we can sustain with this kind of construction. Today, the Prime Minister's advice is launching this. How long do you think it would take to make this popular to really reach that mass housing stage? 
shouldn't take too long. I think we are already talking to, to potential uh, private sector builders. Uh, what we need really is a large number of plants all over the country. And we need also trained workers to correctly build it. And IIT Madras, we've been working on this for the last 10 years. We hope to provide that support uh, to facilitate this construction. We hope this will be a game changer uh, addressing the tremendous housing shortage, especially for the poor people. For a common man to understand, tell us very briefly, so how does it work? You have panels of wall-like structures which you bring and just assemble it. Well, in a normal house, uh, you use bricks, large number of them. You have to put mortar, join them. There are lots of weak locations. It's a mess. You have to plaster everything to cover up all your patches. You don't need to do all that. This is all factory made. The panel comes 12 meter long. You can cut it down to sizes. You have to erect it properly. And the innovation done by IIT Madras is the same panel can be used as a floor, right. as a staircase. You have to intelligently uh, fill it with concrete where required, provide reinforcement where required. You can use it for single story. Four story is perfect. Uh, and eight to ten stories. No beams, no right. columns. Thank you so much for your time, both Thank of you. you. So certainly it's the need of the hour, many would call it Gargi, but we'll have to wait and watch how the government popularizes this, whether the industry will really accept it and make it, take it to the common man. Large number of buildings ranging from individual houses to apartment buildings to schools to large hostels have been built over the years and these have established the suitability of this technology for the purpose of building affordable housing. Okay, so we move on. Uh, really, it's a matter of being inspired. And I want to bring a difference between what is motivation and what is inspiration. Motivation is when you get hold of an idea and carry it through to its conclusion. What is inspiration? Inspiration is when an idea gets hold of you and carries you where you're intended to go. That's true. That is what makes engineering so beautiful. You can't stop it from creatively manifesting itself. Motivation is linked to what you think you should be doing due to peer pressure, societal expectations or obligations because others said it's important and you believed it. So you push yourself seeking success. What is the success? what other people deem it to be success. But inspiration is about being called upon to do something from the core of your inner being, something you are naturally drawn to. The doing and unfolding process can feel effortless, joyous, and fulfilling. This is what we call the flow state. And this is what we all need to experience. And that's when engineering really reaches its fruition. I'll now move on to some consultancy projects that we were involved in, where we learned a lot. And, you know, failures is one place where we can learn a lot. What you see here is a picture of a power plant, a water tank. It's a huge water tank. And it was an EPC contract. It was actually in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. And they had a lot of leakage of water uh, when the tank was commissioned, um, it, it gave a lot of surprises. And so we were invited, IIT Madras was invited to figure out what went wrong and how to solve the problem. As you can see, it's a huge tank, I think uh, 80 meters by 100 meters or so with a partition. And you had uh, columns inside and you had uh, what they call wall columns outside with the wall. 
the column the wall was 600 mm thick all around and the column which is a kind of a stiffener 600 by 1200 mm and spread apart some seven meters or so at regular intervals so we were curious to know uh, how could this have failed so when i visited the designer uh, far away and asked i was shocked to know how this design was done and by the way the water came out you know why it was commissioned the water came out in in jets and they had to block all the holes uh, and still it didn't work so how was the wall design well they took a typical wall panel and uh, they used a reynolds handbook or is 49 uh, is 3370 and they took the assumption that the wall column will stiffen the edges such that each panel can be said to be fixed uh, at the three sides and on top the slab is coming so it can be said to be hinged and subject to hydrostatic pressure and you take the coefficients and design this wall panel well that is that comes from very limited thinking it comes from assumptions which are not true and which can lead to disaster the assumption made was whether the designer knew it or not you are assuming that the wall column is not going to allow the wall to bulge. Imagine you're in a tank, it's filled with water, it's a phenomenal hydrostatic pressure. The whole wall will bulge out and pull along with it the so-called wall columns. So that's a problem deflected shape. And when I said this to the designers, they really got it and they were worried. In fact, I still remember when I went to the restroom the young engineer who was in charge by the way this design was proof checked in chicago and it passed so obviously this was not noticed he actually wept and he told me sir i have a newborn baby and a wife and if i lose this job i'm finished so i was all sympathy for him because you see it can happen to any any one of us and what we need here is not a blame game we need to learn from the mistakes and we need to find solutions without really uh, destroying people. So we did a finite element modeling and we really established that the deflected shape is, is what we visualized and we could explain the failure and manually you could quickly do a calculation as a propped cantilever because horizontally the bending is not much, it's vertically that the bending is going to be and simple structural analysis can show how the bending moments are going to vary. And we compared this with the more rigorous finite element analysis and we found that there were shortcomings, especially at the bottom, which explained the huge horizontal crack. You know, part of this tank is below ground, so you don't see it, which uh, led to all the water coming out. And the vertical cracks are due to shrinkage. And this comes from not giving proper uh, Construction joints this also comes from an erroneous belief that for a wall like this, it's enough to point to give 0.12% nominal uh, uh, reinforcement for shrinkage and temperature. No, you need to give substantially more. And we brought in these concepts in our book in reinforced concrete design. Other mistakes made were, you see, there was a level difference in the roof and uh, unfortunately, the person who designed it thought that uh, you will always have a triangular pressure distribution. Not true, because uh, you can't have, you have to know Pascal's law. Pascal's law says the pressure is the same in all directions. And so you will end up with the same pressure everywhere. This pressure doesn't switch from 71 to 44 kilonewton per meter squared. It remains 70.5. And you have a uplift pressure acting on the depressed portion which was not designed for so lots of blunders made just giving a simple example can happen to any one of us all we need is to learn and to have a clear understanding of science which is what Sri Vishweshwara was pointing at in his original quotation another building I was invited to be part of the special investigation team no, I had to accompany police officers. There was this unfortunate collapse of 11 story building at Chennai, the famous Maulivakam building collapse. There were two identical buildings 
Block A and Block B, 11 story plus two, a stilt and a basement. And one find, they were under construction, almost complete. Almost identical, both the blocks. One block just collapsed on one rainy night. Why did it collapse? How can it collapse? So we went and took a look and uh, clearly the whole thing had caved in and the failure was in the ground floor columns. But a lot of theories came up. Uh, you know, they said the foundations would have collapsed, the soil would have collapsed. Uh, somebody said it's an act of God, you know, it's uh, lightning and so on. But simple calculations, all you need to use is common sense. You look at the column and you see that it's a small column. Columns are only 300 by 450 mm, which is very small for a building of this size. And they were very lightly reinforced, 820 mm bars. And the columns were further reduced to 230 by 450 as you went up. So a simple hand calculation, back of the envelope calculation, which says, if you ignore bending moments and you take only pure axial load, what is the capacity that the column will have? So take the strength of concrete, take the strength of the steel, uh, that's uh, what is left out is 0.87 FY. And uh, you find that it can take only 220 tons. Now take just the dead load, take the tributary area of the column and work out. And you find that that capacity is exceeded by the dead load itself. So it's no wonder that the column collapsed. Plus on top of that, some of the columns, as you can see, are slender. There's no cross beam, it goes two floors, so which will further reduce the strength. So we did simple calculations. We gave a report and you can imagine the outcry uh, this whole thing went all the way to Supreme Court and they declared that this is so obvious that uh, it should have been designed for three times the load it actually did. So it was not surprising it collapsed. The unfortunate thing was the mastery working there who had experience who said, I have built so many buildings. This is the kind of column you give for a six story building. For 11 story, it should be much more. Nobody listened to him. And it collapsed. People who were living in the ground floor, the workers, 60 people died around. And that is bad. And unfortunately, and this is a point I want to bring to all of you, we don't have a system in the country where buildings that come for approval are checked for structural acceptability. The design is only checked for the setbacks and you know town planning purposes, which are important, but which are also violated. And nobody checks the design. And uh, that is where we need to tighten up. If we want to be a self-reliant India, we have to have a clear understanding. This was not done deliberately. It happened, but it exposed us. And so that's why it's important to follow codes, to have proof checking, and to hold people accountable, not to blame anybody, uh, but to make sure we don't have such disasters in the future. Here's another wonderful ex exercise we did. This is in Cambodia, the Taprom Temple. We were assisting the Archaeological Survey of India. Uh, historically, we've helped them for the Angkor Wat complex. There was a geotechnical problem. But more recently, uh, we helped them with their second building which is uh, the Taprom building, very famous structure. And you'll find that in Angkor Wat complex, uh, it's a historical site. The monuments are more than 1,000 years. They are all linked to India because it's uh, the spread of uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. Buddhism of two types, Mahayana and Hinayana, are evident there. And the Cambodia's main source of income is from tourism. And so they really need these uh, structures to survive. And India had an agreement with them. I think $10 million was promised and we had to help sustain these structures. Now we faced a curious, and by the way, there were other countries uh, working in many other projects, mainly from Germany, Japan, China, Switzerland, US, uh, who were also, but this main temple was given to India. And so we had to show that we could do 
what was needed to be done. I mean, we have, we've came across a very uh, difficult uh, problem. You can see that um, there's an outgrowth of trees there. There's a, there's a species of tree which, which is grown all over the place with deep adventitious roots, which uh, hugs the stone. And it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Initially, the, when the plant grows, it hangs on to the stone for its survival. But after some time, it becomes so strong, it moves the stone and the stone hangs on to the tree for its survival. So they knew that the tree itself was an attraction. And they gave us this impossible task of preserving both the tree and the stone. How do we do that? So that was a challenge we took up. First, we had to diagnose how these things fell. We knew that there was a hydraulics problem, but there was also a structural problem of the tree pushing this structure from below. And we had to analyze this and decide the mode of failure and provide retrofitting schemes, which was all done. We took the help of uh, Larson and Trubro to, to actually execute these, uh, this retrofitting scheme. And you see the work done by, by India. Uh, the whole thing was put together in many places. You can see what happened, what was lying in ruin. Three pictures I'm showing you and the transformation after it was restored. This is archaeological, uh, this architectural restoration. And it's reversible in the sense you, you can always put it back. I want to end by talking about one more project that was very challenging. In the uh, 2000, uh, when was it? The tsunami that hit uh, Little Andaman. Uh, we've done many projects in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, but this was. Uh, a lighthouse which was badly affected in a place called Little Andaman or Hut Bay. And uh, we had to go there by ship. And the ship would anchor some distance away because it's that rough sea, 10 degree channel, they say. And uh, we had to go by boat. And you can see in that picture, uh, Captain Suraj, the director general of lighthouses with whom I went. And I think Professor Gandhi also came along. And it was a big challenge to figure out what happened and how to save this lighthouse. This is the original lighthouse. But after the tsunami hit it, it was hit badly. The people living there were all killed because the water entered. All their homes were overturned and this structure was tilted. Here are some details of the structure. It was on good, well foundation. We inspected very carefully and found the foundations were okay. What actually had happened was the structure was affected. We could see the direction of the tsunami. It's not like an earthquake which can swing in both directions, but the wave came from the north direction. And uh, we could see that a plastic hinge had formed at the base of the wall and the bars were all ripped. They were anyway badly corroded because that place is very corrosive. On the northern side, um, the uh, Concrete had spalled off, the bars had been pulled out. And on the other side, the bars were intact and the concrete was intact because it was in, in compression. And we checked we, with the uh, meter the angle of tilt and the angle of tilt was only half a degree. Now, other people who had inspected this tower recommended demolish and rebuild. Now, rebuilding in that location, bringing materials from mainland India would cost a couple of crores. So they asked IIT Madras, they asked us, can you give a workable, simple solution? And we gave them that. We found that this was too beautiful a building. This is the internal staircase, which we climbed on top to destroy. It can be strengthened, it can be preserved. And we gave them a preservation scheme by which we thickened the parts which had been damaged. We, re we put fresh steel where required. We get back the center of gravity so that verticality is maintained and it's not like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And this was implemented and the cost was only 9 lakhs. So this is a classic case where uh, we can do things innovatively 
and uh, do for the well-being of our country. I want to end by saying, point, going back to what I said that engineering is not enough. Learning science, engineering, medicine can be and should be made exciting and inspiring. But this education is not enough to live life meaningfully, to live life authentically, to live life holistically. And so at IIT Madras, we introduced about 10 years ago, two courses which I teach. One is called GN5001 Self-Awareness and the other is called GN6001 Integral Karma Yoga. I have a colleague, Arul Dev, who joins me in teaching this. And you can see that the students are really interested because it's not enough to earn a livelihood. It's more important to know how to live. And these are two textbooks on this, which, uh, which, which I wrote some years back. One is called Stop Sleepwalking Through Life. The other is called Spirituality at Work. Why is this important? Because finally, all of us want to live happy lives. We want to perform well. And on the x-axis in this graph, you see on the right side, high performance, on the left side, poor performance. And uh, you feel good, positive emotions when you're on the right side, you feel negative emotions on the right side. Inside all of us, there is the autonomic nervous system, ANS, which is said to be sympathetic when it's switched on and parasympathetic when we take rest. If you're on the green side, it's balanced. But if you're on the red side, and so being sympathetic, we become over sympathetic during the working time and we are not able to switch off when we go home. So we become sympathetic. This is all well known. <clears throat> so if you're on the green side, if you're really living a fulfilled life, you will feel acceleration, passion, joy, love, care, kindness. You have appreciation, harmony and beauty when you're working. And when you go home and take rest, you have time for inner peace, equanimity, acceptance, forgiveness. You don't nurture grievances against others. You have serenity, reflection, and you're content. Nitya tripto nirashrayaha. But if you're on the red side, we end up being frustrated, angry, hostile, fearful, worried, anxious, guilty, overwhelmed, fatigued, resentful, judgmental. When we go home, we carry these problems with us. And sometimes the, the home is a problem which we carry to the office. There's a sense of hopelessness, despair, depression, burnt out feeling, fatigue, withdrawal, boredom, apathy, depression. So the real task for all of us, whether Indian or otherwise, whether engineers or otherwise, is to stay away from the red side and to live in the green side. You know, the vast majority of us are probably on the red side. So we have to know what is it that we may be doing unconsciously, which is pushing us there. And what is it that we need to unlearn and nurture so that we consistently operate on the green side. So in the old, in the old mantra from the Rig Veda says, Tamaso ma, Asato Ma Satkame. We have to move from from that which is not real, not true, to that which is real. Tamaso ma jyotir kamaya. That which is full of darkness and depression, to that which is full of light. Mrityur ma amritam kamaya. That which takes us to death. Move from that to that which takes us to immortality. And that is conscious evolution. You'll find this problem in all organizations, especially government organizations. People who came together to help succeed actually end up delighting in each other's failures and resenting each other's successes. We withhold information and resources from one another, try to control one another and blame one another. When I'm blaming A or B or department X, Y, Z and suggesting that all our problems will be solved if only they straighten up, I'm doing it because their shortcomings justify my failure to improve. What begins as a conflict between two persons spread to a war between many. Finally, organizations are filled with people whose energies are largely spent on sustaining collusion. 
Now that is universal, but that is not the India that we want. How do we change that? By changing ourselves. I want to end with this slide of our former president, Sri Abdul Kalam, who lived a very simple life and who practiced much of what we had discussed here. He was a scientist and uh, he had absolute clarity on what is needed for India and how we can find fulfillment. In his words, difficulties in your life do not come to destroy you, but to help you realize your hidden potential and power. We are all born with a divine fire in us. Our efforts should be to give wings to this fire and fill the world with the glow of its goodness. So that's all. I'm showing you a scene from IIT Madras, just outside our building science block, where we sometimes conduct courses. This is a course we conduct every year in the month of June, about 100 teachers from all over the country come and we have a course, a week-long course called Self-Awareness and Higher Goals in Education. So with these few words, I want to end this presentation and uh, I just want to say, conclude that we really have it all in us. The secret to self-reliance is in us. We must nurture the company of masters who live that life. We must know what it means to do teamwork without keeping a higher ideal in mind. And uh, that is what the country needs. That is what we all need. But ultimately, self-reliance comes from our innermost being. And it's the way we express that is not, not by struggling to do things in order to fill some lack or to find happiness, but to find our true nature, our true sense of self, our inner happiness, and to express that in all that we do, an expression of truth, beauty, and goodness. Thank you.